I'm Rachel, it's really nice to meet you if I haven't met you already, I'm one of the critical care specialists here. Um, just like quick show of hands, like how many people have you um, came to like, the last one I did of the cardiovascular, great. And also, I didn't realise that this is also a mix of vets and nurses, so have we got nurses here too? Oh cool, okay, sorry. So I'll, um, I'll try and make it um, interesting for both of you. And then before I forget, um, Tony said, would you mind filling out your paperwork at the end? Thank you. Um, cool, so I'm going to talk about cardiovascular stabilisation. Um, caveat, I'm not a cardiologist, this is just from like an ECC perspective, um, but um, yeah, hopefully you'll still find it useful. So just to kind of um, recap, there's a bit of repetition from the last lecture, but it's good, it's good for you. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about shock and blood pressure and things, um, and can anybody uh, define shock for me? I mean, you might remember from last time, or not. Just even throw out like an idea. Didn't someone say anything? No? Insufficient option delivery to the tissue. Ah oh, yeah, smashed it. Well done. Okay, good. So that's one that's one um, way to look at it. So it's a cell a state of cellular or tissue hypoxia. And the most common thing is due to reduced oxygen delivery to your tissues. But um, it could also be due to other things such as increased oxygen consumption, like if you're having seizures, hypothermia, um, inadequate oxygen utilisation, which is things like sometimes patients that are septic, um, they have mitochondrial dysfunction um, and cyanide toxicity as well, um, or a combination of these processes. So, yeah, it's an important one to make sure that we know. Um, and then with regards to... Um, sort of like considering our cardiovascular system more specifically, um, does anybody know like the types of shock that if I said, I would say there's like four of the main categories, can anyone think of the different types? Yeah, perfect, that's a really good one. Yeah, anyone else? Hypovolemic, yeah, anyone else? Got so we've got cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive, yeah. Yeah, I think septic shock comes more under distributive, but I can't remember because sometimes... Um, they're, yeah, so that's probably more distributive, but it's the same kind of thing. Um, so ignore the JVP bits. Um, but yeah, in, in, your, in our clinical practice, probably the most common type of shock we'll see is hypovolemic shock. Um, and that's reduced vascular volume. Um, so if we kind of think of like the heart as a pump and then your blood vessels as your pipes and things like that. So um, yeah, cardiogenic is when you've got an actual problem with your, with your pump. And then we'll go through the other two as well. Um, this is a human sort of, uh, I don't know what this is called, like flow chart, there you go, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's useful to kind of like visualize them. And then when we think about like your blood pressure, so when you're measuring blood pressure, like say you're doing it invasively or non-invasively, it doesn't particularly matter, but what are the things that are leading to you having that blood pressure? So how do you generate that pressure? Yeah, cardiac output, perfect. And what's that going to be dependent on? So if we think cardiac output, the amount of yeah, blood you're saying that's leaving your heart, what's that dependent on? Yeah, great. You guys are doing great. Um, so yeah, that's really good. So we'll kind of break it down a bit more. So we've got cardiac output here, which is the big one. And then that's going to be dependent. So cardiac output's measured over a minute, and it's going to be dependent on your heart rate. But then it's also going to be dependent on your stroke volume, which is your preload um, your contractility and your afterload. So preload is how much blood volume, essentially, I think of it simplistically as in your left ventricle before you kind of contract. Um, the strength of your contraction is your contractility and then the afterload is the pressure that the left ventricle has to overcome in the aorta, the systemic blood pressure really, to get that volume out. Um, and then all those things combined give you your cardiac output. And then for your blood pressure, it's a combination of your cardiac output and then your systemic vascular resistance. So essentially just like how much tone your vessels have. Because um, if you could imagine you've got a hose with like, I don't know, a couple of hundreds of litres of water in it and it's a very narrow kind of like quite taut hose versus something that's, I don't think there's such a thing as like a springy hose, but one that's kind of got like loose walls, um, it's going to have less pressure at the end. Good, good job. So I just wanted to quickly, um, actually, you know what, I, I might just do this one really quickly, but essentially it's just to say that the reason we need, um, the reason we go into shock um, is essentially because we can't produce ATP, which is the energy that 
sort of fires up all the cells in our body. Um, and how we produce ATP is through, in our mitochondria, through the electron transport chain, and it uses oxygen. So when you're in shock, essentially you can't produce energy. And without energy, hopefully this will be the next slide, um, Oh, that's about my son. Without energy, the main thing I kind of think of is that you can't, um, you can't maintain your normal gradients of electrolytes. So your sodium being mostly outside the cell, your potassium being mostly inside the cell, because this um, sodium potassium ATPase pump that's on basically all cells needs energy because it's pumping electrolytes against their concentration gradients. Um, so without that, um, basically your cells die because you have either an influx of sodium into the cell bringing water with it um, and you lose your cell membrane integrity. Um, and also you can't then generate action potentials because you don't have that difference across the membrane of your sodium and your potassium. So that's how that works. So we're going to talk briefly about hypovolemic shock. Um, again, really common for these reasons. Um, we see a lot of, a lot of this stuff. Um, and Causes of it. So we can have gastrointestinal fluid loss, which is really common. Hemorrhage. This is a little poor dog here that got, um, we saw him at the Ralph and he um, got shot on the head by the police during a drugs raid, pretty, pretty full on. Um, he's fine. And um, he, so yeah, hemorrhage, urinary losses. So this poor um, fat cat here, he's got post-obstructive diuresis. Um, you can have vast quantities of urine and, and fluid loss through that. Third spacing. And then potentially inadequate water intake, which is like less common, but um, yeah, it does, it does happen. So the one thing I kind of wanted to mention specifically is that with the um, gastrointestinal fluid loss, it's not always outwardly apparent. So I'm sure like you've all seen these horrible like hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome cases um, and you'll give them some fluid boluses and they might be stable for an hour or so. And then they become tachycardic, hypotensive again. You're like, well, what, what's happened? Um, and yeah, you will get some redistribution of your fluid into your, into your extravascular tissues. But also what we can sometimes see is that they've got such severe ileus that it will all just pool in their intestines. And when you scan them on ultrasound, they'll have hugely descended stomach intestines with fluid. So just kind of being aware that like, yes, you can have hypovolemic shock because of obvious external blood loss or obvious diarrhea or vomiting um, or urine loss, but sometimes it can happen in, in compartments and that might be within the pleural space, the peritoneal space or within the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so it is make, you know, useful to make sure you consider that and if you have ultrasound to check. Um, good, so how might we um, recognize shock in a, a patient? Um, so let's say a dog versus a cat. So let's go with dog first. What would a shocky dog look like? Tachycardic. Yeah, usually tachycardic. Although I suppose if it's going to be cardiogenic, it could be bradycardic as well. But yeah, typically if it's hypovolemic, it's usually going to be tachycardic. Yeah. Yeah, so if they're dehydrated, they might have tachy mucous membranes. Um, I always start when I'm trying to think about like describing the patient with like their mental status. So if they're in quite severe shock, they'll be like obtunded. They might be non-ambulatory. Usually tachycardic if it's hypovolemic. Very, very end stage. I've probably seen like two patients in the whole of like 10 years that have been so hypovolemic, they've become bradycardic and they're sort of peri-arrest. Um, hypotensive, cold extremities, all that sort of thing. Um, and then what's the difference between cats and dogs in shock if we're specifically thinking about hypovolemic shock or, or potentially septic shock? Yeah, so cats tend to be bradycardic, so they don't seem to get that same sympathetic kind of stimulation to, to be tachycardic, so usually a bit more bradycardic. Um, good. So, yeah, so how do we recognise that we think our patient's in shock, you know, they've come in, they're obtunded, pale mucous membranes, we think it's hypovolemic because of the history, um, and we found some clinical exam findings that could be consistent with it. So how might we determine what sort of shock this patient's in? Um, so looking at things like MDB just stands for like your minimum database. So information you might get would be things like your PCV and your total solids, which if you know that they're very hemoconcentrated, you could say, okay, potentially they've had some, some fluid loss. The lactate could be a bit high as well. Um, although do be careful with lactate because um, there's two different types of hyperlactatemia. So you can have type A and type B. Um, and type B is not always dependent on perfusion. So it could be like liver dysfunction, drugs, other things. Um, 
the one really useful thing which we love when you guys do is like please weigh them every single time your patient comes in and record it because it's super helpful for, for you and for us because if we then see your cases, you know, like two weeks later and they've been in for a vaccination with you and they were 30 kilos and now they're coming in to us and they've got severe vomiting and diarrhea and they're, and they're 27 kilos, then we can tell that they've lost 10% of their body weight. So they're probably acutely um, having that fluid loss. So they're probably like 10% dehydrated, hypovolemic. So it's really useful. We use weight all the time. Um, and it's also quite helpful because then you can say, all right, I think you've lost 10% of your sort of um, volume and we need to replace that. And how often do we need, you know, like over what time frame? So maybe 24 hours if you're dehydrated. Um, and then you have a weight to target so you can weigh them and recheck them. Um, and sorry, that's more for dehydration than, than shock. And then if I'm not sure a patient's in hypovolemic shock and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know, like maybe you're tachycardic because of pain or something else, then sometimes I'll do this um, fluid test, so like five and five. So I'll give a five mil per kilo fluid bolus in five minutes. And essentially that will then tell me, do they respond to the fluid bolus positively? So did their blood pressure come up? Did their mentation improve? Are they a bit more sort of, um, pink and, and usually more like does their heart rate drop and come down um, and the reason I do that is that it gives me the opportunity to like try a fluid bolus without committing to quite a large volume like 10 or 15 or 20 mils per kilo because if you got it wrong and say they're actually in cardiogenic shock rather than hypovolemic shock then although a 5 mil per kilo bolus isn't the best thing you could do for them it's not as bad as giving 10 or 20 mil per kilo so you can kind of give it a little tester and see um, and then the other thing, I mean, I love ultrasound. I said that last time. So if you've got an ultrasound um, and you're kind of trying to figure out, are, you, are they in hypovolemic shock? So in addition to your history, your bloods, you know, maybe a fluid responsive test that you can do, um, looking at their weight and how that might have changed. Um, the other thing you can do is a little scan of the heart. Um, so you don't have to be amazing at ultrasound for this. Um, just get a view of the left ventricle and if you see the ventricle walls kissing or touching, um, then you can kind of get the impression that there's a loss of volume there. So that might also give you a bit of a um, bit more sort of confidence to build that picture of hypovolemic shock. Um, although be cautious, which I'm sure you know what I'm going to say, but you know specifically in cats, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you won't really you see that in dogs, but it can look like a sort of pseudo hypertrophy. Well, it can look like they, their volume depletes when actually they've got a very large left atrium and their volume overloaded. So, whenever I'm checking a left, um, whenever I'm checking the left ventricle for volume, I will have a quick look at the left atrium just to make sure it's not massive, um, so that I can be reassured that the left ventricle is not just empty because there's so much tissue, there's not any space for the blood. Um, and although I did say that cats tend to get HCM, there is a situation in dogs where you might actually see like le left ventricular hypertrophy. And that would be if there was really, really chronic um, sort of hypertension and, you know, the heart was having to really push against a high afterload. So maybe a dog that had like a phaochromocytoma or really sort of something like that. Um, not very common, but it's just worth bearing that in mind. Um, yeah, so how do we resuscitate them? So what, when, you, when you identify your patients in hypovolemic shock, what kind of things do you do in your practice? Like if you were hooking them up to some fluids, what would you ask for? What would you say to your nurses? Or nurses, what do you get asked to do? <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, but what are you going to say? Like, Yeah, perfect. I mean, I love it if you say that. That's really good. Um, so I hear a lot of people saying that they're going to do like shock rate fluids, which makes me feel very sad um, because do you know what the shock rate is? Huh? Oh, well, that would be good if it was 50 mils per kilo. But I think traditionally a lot of people have thought of it as for cats, 60 mils per kilo and 90 mils per kilo for dogs. I don't know if you've heard those rates sort of. But what that actually is, is their entire blood volume. So... 90 mil per kilo is your dog's blood volume. So, and this does happen, you know, and it's not, you know, I've done things like that too, but if you're gonna replace basically an entire blood volume with saline, um, you're gonna cause a lot of problems. So, you know, potentially coagulopathy, hypothermia, tissue edema. Um, so 
really what we need to be thinking of is when we give a fluid bolus, we're giving a dose of like if we were giving a drug. Um, so I would say that when we're bolusing crystalloids, depending on how the patient is, if they're a bit maybe not so severe, you know, five mil per kilo in five minutes, see what happens, 10 mil per kilo. And I don't normally go straight out guns blazing anything higher than 15 mil per kilo, because um, you can't take fluid back. But uh, if you think, you know what, they're gonna arrest if I don't give them a chunky bolus, then by all means go for it. But just try to always err on the side of a bit of caution there. Um, and then, yeah, you want to do it over 10 to 15 minutes and reassess your patient at the end of it. So you need to have like these good endpoints where, OK, the dog's heart rate was 160 and now it's 140 and that's good. But it's actually a spaniel and it probably should have a resting heart rate of 60 rather than 140. So, yes, there might be an element of pain and other things going on, but try and put it into context of your patient. Um, yeah. Be just a little note there, be very cautious um, with, so, oh yes, I'm sorry, if you, so when you're bolusing, you will get to a point where you sometimes are going, God, I've given a lot of fluid, um, how much can I give? So I would normally say that that 90 and 60 mil per kilo amount could be given over 24 hours, you know, like in total, so you need to kind of keep an eye. So if you've got a patient that's got hemorrhagic, vomiting and diarrhea, you know, you might have to give multiple boluses and you might end up giving them 90 mil per kilo over, over 24 hours. But within a short space of time, so within like sort of six to maybe six hours, I wouldn't really be going anything higher than sort of 40, 40 mil per kilo or 50 mil per kilo. Um, I think if you're continually bolusing, continuously bolusing this patient and they keep going back into shock, that's when, which we'll talk about in a minute, you might want to be thinking about actually do they need a bit of plasma or something that's not just a crystalloid that's maybe got some coagulation factors in it, a little bit of protein and other things. Um, so, yeah, I tend to sort of say cats, like maybe 30, 40 mil per kilo of crystalloids, I start to be a bit like, oh, do I need to think of other things? And for dogs, maybe 30, 40 mil per kilo. But that's within the shorter time frame, but then spread out over 24 hours, it would probably be okay. Um, be really careful if you've got sodium derangement. So if you've got um, an Addisonian patient that comes in, it's severely hypovolemic and it's got a sodium of 116 or 120, when normal for dogs would be 135 to 155. Um, if you're bolusing them with Hartman, so you don't have to know this off the top of your head, but you know, um, Hartman's, the sodium content of that is about 132. Um, and then um, for normal saline or 0.9% um, saline, it's sort of in the 150s. So we don't want to change any sodium balance. Like, so if your dog's been hyponatremic for quite a long time, if you suddenly raise that sodium level too quickly, you can then cause some neurological issues. So if you're not sure, I would always say, if you have a patient with either quite high sodium or, or low sodium, um, ideally you'd resuscitate them with fluids as close to their sodium level as possible. Um, so we actually make up custom fluids. It's actually not that hard to do. So you're welcome to just call us for advice if you have one of these patients. Um, but we'll either put some hypertonic saline in to make it a bit more concentrated, or we might use a, a, a product like D5W, which is just water with a bit of glucose in it. Um, but yeah, I think just have it in the back of your mind. If you ever have a patient that's very hypovolemic, you want to give them fluid resuscitation and they've got a sodium derangement, you need to stop and get some advice before you go too, too mad with some fluids. Um, you'd probably be all right with one or two boluses, but any more than that, you need to be a bit cautious. Um, if you've got a hypovolemic patient who's de uh, not dehydrated, um, then hypertonic saline is a really nice option, so two to four mil per kilo. So if they've had acute blood loss, um, that's a nice, nice one. It's really nice in trauma patients as well. It helps if they've got any element of traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's quite good because, um, particularly in like a trauma patient where they might have pulmonary contusions and things, um, giving a lot of crystalloids that's going to extra vasate and end up in lungs and other tissues, um, you know, it, it's nice to be a bit fluid restrictive if you can. Um, and then blood, blood products as needed, so if you're having to give a lot of crystalloids, you might end up giving plasma, um, and also replacing like for like, so potentially if you've got the option to give packed red blood cells, that's great. Um, and then if you've got a patient who 
has maybe got abdominal trauma and is likely to need to go to surgery. Um, it's probably beyond the scope of this lecture to go into that in too much detail, but if you know you're going to surgery and they've maybe got a ruptured spleen or you know you think there's something going on in there, um, you might want to consider hypotensive resuscitation. So potentially just not targeting a higher blood pressure than sort of 90. Um, if you've got a traumatic brain injury, you might err on the sort of higher end of that, so 90, 95. But the thought process is you don't want to, if there's a clot, blow that off before you then go into theatre. So just being a bit, bit careful with that. Um, and this is a picture of a dog that's kind of got some fluid overload there. So, you know, you can see that chemosis. Um, and then this little septic patient's very edematous as well. So just kind of remembering that we need to be careful with fluids. In people, it's, it's super interesting. Like, if, you got, if one of you got hit by a bus, like, God forbid, um, they have got this policy of being, like, very restrictive with, um, with fluids because people just get volume overloaded really quickly and it's associated with increased mortality so you'll get like one fluid bolus of 10 mil per kilo and then you'll get your blood product so you'll get platelets plasma and and um and just pure blood um but they've recognized that people coming in with lots of sort of crystalloids on board have worth worse prognosis um and then again like one of the things i just wanted to kind of chat about quickly is the um the tissue edema so we want to always make sure we've got really good perfusion to our vital organs. Um, and, you know, the kidneys are one of those really important organs in our body. And if we overfill them, if we overfill our tissues with, um, with crystalloids and it sort of gets extravasated, we create edema. Um, and essentially the kidney is in like its little capsule um, and it's got very edematous and swollen on the inside, like that chemosis on the eye, but like in your, in your kidney. And that will actually reduce your renal blood flow because the blood trying to get into the kidney is fighting against this pressure so it can reduce renal perfusion to the point that it can actually contribute a little bit to azotemia and that can happen in all tissues it can happen in your guts um, it can contribute to ileus so just being really careful um, so how would we monitor um, if we've got a patient that's hypovolemic, um, first of all, we've talked about their response, but how will we monitor like ongoing losses? What are the things, you know, let's say it's not as simple as there was a bleeding spleen and you fixed it. Let's say we've got some vomiting diarrhea that's ongoing or some, you know, urinary losses. What kind of things could we, could we look at? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And, and your patient as well. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good suggestion. So um, remembering these patients are very dynamic. So if you've got a parvo puppy or a hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome dog, um, they might be stable one hour and then the next they're like on death's door because they've had huge losses. Or we've got a little dog with ITP. Actually, she did go home. Immune mediated thrombocytopenia. You know, and she would have, be fine and then half an hour later have a big bleed and be very hypovolemic again. So just monitoring carefully. Um, much to like the nurse's despair, but like weight checks every four hours, you know, um, and, and tracking that, it's super helpful. Like overnight, um, if we come in in the morning, we've, we can see exactly, okay, this cat's lost 200 grams, so that's how behind we are with our fluids. Um, but remembering as well that you need to always weigh if they've not got a urinary catheter in either before or after their walk, so it's kind of everyone's on the same page. Um, I love an NG tube. With Everybody in ICU's got an NG tube. They're brilliant. Um, so you can pop that in and check your gastric residuals. Um, be really careful because one of my colleagues um, at another referral centre, not this one, um, somebody was an orthopod, not you know saying they don't know what they're doing, but um, was draining an NG tube of a dog that had a lot of gastric residuals. Um, basically just took out all of their hydrochloric acid, all of their chloride, and, and gave them a really, really severe um, sort of metabolic alkalosis and made them quite poorly and unwell. So just remember every time you take something out, um, you need to be keeping a close eye on those uh, that acid base status because you'll be removing acid from your patient's stomach. Um, so what we would normally do here would be to empty out the stomach and then put in about 10 mil per kilo back. So you're kind of returning a bit of that acid into the, into the patient. Um, and then do check the electrolytes and the acid base status over, over the day. Um, and then fecal Foley catheters, do you guys use those? They're really amazing. 
Oh. So we had no idea. We wanted to. Yeah. So we were like, we really wanted to do yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. We just had no idea. Yeah. So there's not, I don't think there's such a protocol, but there should be because there's horrible complications if it goes wrong. But basically, it's just a normal Foley. Um, and I, this is not like very scientific, but I inflate it with an amount of, of fluid and just look at it and eyeball it and be like, that's about the size of a Labrador poo um, if I'm putting it into a Labrador. And then be like, okay, so 20 mils. You put it in quite far, but so it's still in the rectum. Um, and then, yeah, it must remember to attach the bag before you insert it. Otherwise, what you just create is a tap, um, which I have done, and it's really awful. Um, so make sure the bag's attached. Um, and, and then you can weigh that, which is really good, every four hours. And then the protocol we would use would be to deflate it every four hours and move it so that you don't create an area of like pressure necrosis. Um, and just don't overinflate because there is there is some complications reported of people causing necrosis and, and you know the guts then breaking down. But yeah, it's brilliant for that. So if you've and obviously we want a urinary catheter if they've got big urinary out losses as well. Um, and I think you know sometimes these patients might be producing absolutely mad volumes or losing volumes. You know sometimes cats post obstructive diuresis ten mil per kilo per hour. Um, so until I've got like a pattern of what um, their outs are, I might say, actually, we need ins and outs every hour. And then I'm like, OK, over the last four hours, you've roughly been having this amount of outs. So I know what my fluid balance is going to be. Um, and although it might seem scary to have a patient on 10 mil per kilo per hour Hartmann's, that's quite a lot. If that's what they're producing, you're good. But you just need to make sure that you're balancing that um, and remembering as well other places where these losses could be occurring, too. Um, but as many outs as you can measure, the better you can be with your prescription of fluids. Um, and then plasma transfusion. So we don't use this really for um, raising albumin. I think most people kind of are familiar with that now. It doesn't really achieve that. So you would have to give your patient 20 to 30 mils per kilo to raise the albumin by like 0.5 of a gram per deciliter. So that's like nothing. Um, but the things it is good for is that it does um, sort of stay in the vasculature a little bit better. It doesn't extravasate as much as your crystalloids do because you give a bolus of crystalloids and within you know, quite a short space of time, the majority of it has moved out into your interstitium. Um, it contains coagulation factors, which is great because the more fluids you give, the more you dilute those coagulation factors. Um, it helps to preserve the endothelial glycocalyx, which is the kind of furry lining of your vessels. And, you know, that is very important in, in clotting and in, you know, the sort of um, movement of blood in a smooth way. Um, but the thing to remember is that it is immunogenic, so you can have some reactions with it. Um, so you need to sort of treat it as if you were giving a blood transfusion, do it nice and slow. Um, and I would be reaching for plasma probably in a dog who during quite a short space of time in resuscitation had needed 40 mil per kilo of crystalloids and was continuing to have a lot of losses, um, it would be a good option. So we had a septic patient last night who had 50, 60 mil per kilo um, fluid resuscitation since admission. So I think it was maybe four hours and then during surgery. And then he, after that, because um, that was quite a lot, um, got some units of plasma overnight. So that would be kind of like how we'd, how we'd work it. Um, cool, and I think that's mostly it for the hypovolemic shock. I don't know if anyone's got any specific questions on, on that, but if not, we can kind of circle back to it. Um, but yeah, just remembering that dehydration and hypovolemia are really different. So hypovolemia needs to be addressed really quickly within 15, 20 minutes if you can, or you know, it might be you have to do multiple steps to get them back to being normovolemic, but you want that sorted quickly and you want to be on it quickly because that's life-threatening. But dehydration, we can then correct over a slightly slower period of time, maybe 24, 48 hours. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of the take-homes for that. I, you know what, I have literally in my whole career, like never used a um, colloid. Um, so I haven't. I've used albumin twice and that was like, they both died, but not because of the albumin, because that's how sick they were. Um, but normally I can get away with crystalloids, plasma and some norepinephrine or something like that. But I think the kind of, the research in people telling us that it contributes to acute kidney injury um, and also the potential for coagulopathy as well. Um, I just don't, don't, and I don't seem to need it. So 
don't know. I just don't. But yeah, everyone's different. It, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I kind of prefer plasma really. But if you don't have it, I guess you could. Um, but just be aware of like limitations, really. Yeah. Um, cool. And then we'll um, we'll probably work through these a little bit quicker because they're not as common. But we're going to talk about cardiogenic shock. Um, so. How do we recognise a patient is in cardiogenic shock? So we, we've got our patient that's coming in shock. We don't think it's hypovolemic, so we've got to think about the other options. So recognition, so they might have arrhythmias, a murmur or a gallop. In cats, um, a gallop is, is more common. Um, and then we might see that they've got reduced systolic function. So again, I'm not a cardiologist and I'm really not able to do a full heart scan but I can certainly look at a heart and see subjectively what the contractility looks like. So they're going to be in cardiac um, cardiogenic shock because um, of a reduction in their systolic function it's not going to be subtle like none of the ECC things are particularly subtle um, so you can have a look and sort of be like okay is the heart just doing that in which case we need to you know think about a treatment option. Um, some people have troponin to measure in practice, so if you've got it, it's quite a nice thing to sort of say, okay, actually there is some myocardial damage, you might not, we don't always do it. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is to realise that your patient's got an adequate volume status, or they might even be like hypervolemic, maybe if they've had like long-standing cardiac disease, but because it allows you to rule out that hypovolemia. And then we can also look at an ECG too. So... And the types of um, cardiogenic shock. So bradyarrhythmias, um, certainly, you know, if you've got a very slow heart rate, um, that can certainly cause a reduction in your cardiac output and your tissue perfusion. Um, and things that can cause that, so hypoglycemia, hypercalcemia, hypo or, oh, why have I written that twice? Hypo or hypercalcemia. Um, toxicity, so with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, and that might be something that if you've got a person at home who's elderly, they might be on these medications and maybe the dog has got into them. And then uh, probably I would say a little bit more commonly would be like the sinoatrial or, or AV nodal disease. So it might be a slightly older patient maybe that's got a bit of like cardiac disease and fibrosis potentially. Um, and... You can also, so like on this patient on the bottom here, as you can hopefully see, we've got like a lot of P waves on our ECG on our baseline, but the actual conversion like to the ventricular rate is quite low. So it's really important if you've got a patient coming in in shock that you do put your multi-parameter reader on them because sometimes you can actually... Um, sort of hear your atrial beat and you might be like oh I actually think you've got a heart rate of like 100 um, but you may need to make sure you're palpating the pulse at the same time so is that is that beat being converted into actual cardiac output um, and I say that and I never do it which is really naughty but like you must do both um, just to check that we're actually getting like forward perfusion as well um, good and then um, I was just going to say, what else was I going to say? So bradycardia is not, you, you don't necessarily always have to treat it if your patient's not showing clinical signs of shock or hypotension. And it's usually one of, going to be something that, unless it's something easily correctable by you in practice, like they're hypoglycemic for some reason or they've got electrolyte abnormalities, um, I think that's meant to say hyperkalemia, so high potassium, um, then really if you've ruled out those things it's going to be a patient that you need to refer because it might be they need a pacemaker because they've actually got structural cardiac disease that's causing, causing that bradyarrhythmia um, and then just this just such a cool video of this cat so this cat presented when I was at the RVC for a neuro consult um, because they thought it had been having seizures but if you watch this ECG I just love it and look at the cat's face as well so in a second it's just absolutely asystole and the cat, like, no heartbeat. Look at it, and it's just like, oh, I feel a bit weird. I just feel really weird. <laughs> and isn't that so cool? And that's all it does, and its heart stops for, like, almost a minute or something. Um, I know, I love it. It's such a little champ. See, this little, um, <laughs> this little cat got a pacemaker um, and did really well. Um, so I think just remembering that cats, if they've got these neurological signs, you know, it could be something like this. Um, and also with dogs, you know, particularly um, if they have like syncopal episodes um, in exercise, fine. But they can also sometimes have, um, you know, at rest when they're asleep, they can have some, some issues too. So um, 
I think just expect the unexpected with them. <laughs> it's just like such a weird, I love this fact. Oh dear, um, amazing. It's like, I just feel weird. Um, right, how do I change the thing? Um, so yeah, treating a bradyarrhythmia. arrhythmia. So first of all, we need to recognize that it's present. So we recognize the shock and then we get the heart rate and we check the pulses and we do our ECG and we either determine that there's like an absolute, you know, you might have, for example, no atrial contractions or you might have atrial contractions that are not being conducted through your AV node um, to your ventricles. Um, so treat any electrolyte abnormalities, treat hypoglycemia. If your patient's hypoglycemic or has electrolyte abnormalities, obviously they've got other illness going on. So you need to think, are you septic? Did someone give you too much insulin? Have you got a urethral obstruction? Like what's happening? Um, and then you need to be a bit cautious um, when you're treating them about your drug choices. So if your patient is bradyarrhythmic, you don't really want to be giving them drugs that are going to contribute to that even more. So like you wouldn't give them dexmedetomidine and you try not to give them opioids as well. Um, the reason being is that on your heart, so we've got the cardiomyocyte on the right there. So you can kind of ignore all of the bit in the middle really, but the sympathetic innervation of the heart is going to be predominantly beta one, which is going to kind of cause your heart to beat. Um, and that's going to be norepinephrine, epinephrine, that are your kind of catecholamines that will cause that. And then the parasympathetic innervation is um, acetylcholine mediated, and that's on your muscarinic 2 receptors. And I only found this out recently because I just was like, why do opioids make your patient bradycardic? It's annoying and no one seems to know the answer. And I googled it and the humans knew the answer. But um, essentially, opioids can... Um, inhibit your acetylcholine esterases, which are your enzymes that will break down acetylcholine at your neuromus at your um, sort of synapses. So essentially they just mean like your your when you give a methadone bolus, it um, stops that acetylcholine from being broken down. So there's more acetylcholine available to then bind onto your muscarinic receptors, which has that negative effect on your heart rate. So it basically just potentiates your parasympathetic innovation of your heart. So it does have an effect. Um, so you want to also think about doing anything you can to reduce your patient's vagal tone. So again, you know, the vagus nerve with the acetylcholine, we want to make sure that's not contributing to the bradyarrhythmia. arrhythmia. So anyone got any thoughts on what kind of things might increase vagal tone? Yeah, pressure on the eyes, what else? Hmm? Yeah, oh, sorry. So, you, yeah, you could give atropine. We'll do that in a minute. But the other thing would be, like, no jugular pressure. If they've got a full bladder, if they're vomiting, you know, sometimes we say patients can, like, bagel and die when they've got high vagal tone anyway and then they have a big vomit or something. So trying to, like, maybe give moropitin, empty the bladder, all that kind of thing. Um, and then if they're hemodynamically unstable, then you could give something that's an anticholinergic. So you could give your atropine um, and you can see if there's a response to that. So we would say there's a response if you have a heart rate increase by 50% in sort of five to 10 minutes or so. Um, and then if none of these things are kind of working for you, um, you might have some structural cardiac disease or maybe they've eaten a um, sort of a toxin that actually needs time to kind of be processed out of their body or like one of your your sort of client's medications, then they might need either temporary or, or permanent pacing, um, which would be a referral thing. So we could do temporary via like a, a sort of transvenous route, or you can also do permanent pacing, um, but that's, that's a cardiology thing. So yeah, so I think just um, with bradyarrhythmias, just remember like when you have that patient come in in shock, you're assessing for all of these things concurrently. So like a shocky patient, just whack an ECG on them while you auscultate them. And then you're looking at the heart and you're looking for contractility and you're looking for volume status and you're kind of filtering out in your brain, okay, this is actually looking more cardiogenic versus um, hypovolemic. And then on the other side, we've got these tachyarrhythmias, which can also cause a cardiogenic shock. So we can have a sinus tachycardia, which is when the heart rate is within the physiological range for the species. Um, supraventricular tachycardia, so that's coming from sort of above the ventricles. So um, you can have premature contractions. Um, you can have a supraventricular tachycardia coming from the SA node. Um, and you can also have atrial fibrillation. And then we can have ventricular tachycardias, which is when your ventricles are doing their own thing. So you can have VPCs. 
um, accelerated idioventricular rhythms, which basically is usually like a ventricular tachycardia, but it's less than 160 and it's quite regular. Um, ventricular tachycardia and then not a good thing, ventricular fibrillation, which is, which is going to kill you quick. Um, so, sorry, I'm trying to get through these quickly because I don't want to keep you guys too long, but um, atrial fibrillation. So something you might see in, in big dogs is kind of like maybe actually a slow atrial fibrillation. Their heart's very big can not necessarily be such a bad pathology. Um, but it can be tricky to recognise. Sometimes you can have a slow AF, but actually oftentimes if they're going to be in shock from it, they'll, it will be rapid. Um, and then it's really hard to like diagnose. And I personally am hopeless at ECGs. I don't think I could even connect a six e lead ECG properly. Like I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't know. Um, but you can use your multi-parameter reader for it. And you don't need anything more fancy than that to kind of get your basics. So first of all, when you auscultate your patient, hopefully you'll know this analogy, but it sounds like tennis shoes and a, like in a, what do you call it, tumble dryer or wash, yeah, no, actually not wash, it was called water, um, but tumble dryer. So it's an irregularly irregular rhythm. Um, normally you would have a lack of P waves um, because it's kind of disorganized. Um, and we don't have this isoelectric baseline, so it's kind of like wavy and irregular. And then um, the thing that I find the most useful is that you know you've got atrial fibrillation when you've got an irregular RR interval. So I'll get a piece of paper and I'll put it like here, for example, and I'll do that on the screen of the multi-parameter reader and I'll draw two lines and then I'll just go along and check and compare and be like, oh, actually, no, that one's longer, that one's shorter, that one's longer. So it kind of gives you that visual of comparing those RR intervals and if they're all irregular, then you know you've probably got atrial fibrillation. You might be thinking, well, if I can hear it, then I know it's that. But actually, when you've got a blooming great big St. Bernard that's coming in that's panty and it's got loads of fur and it's fat and you're trying to auscultate the heart, it's so hard. Um, but putting on your ECG and just doing that check can be really helpful. Um, and then um, in terms of treatment, so I'm not sure many of you would have diltiazem, but essentially what we're normally trying to do is we've got all these sort of um, ectopic foci at the, in the atria firing off randomly and they're all getting conducted through the AV node really quickly and they're setting off the ventricles. So we want to kind of put like a blockade in. We want some bouncers there being like, whoa, you all can't come through at the same time. Um, so that's what diltiazem will do. It basically will slow down conduction through the AV node and that's like the way we achieve rate control. So we don't necessarily stop all these things firing off. You might still have a very high atrial rate, but it's not going to be converted into a very high ventricular rate. Um, and the reason that this can cause cardiogenic shock is because if your ventricles are going like super quick all the time, there's not that time for them to relax and fill with blood. And so you don't get your good stroke volume um, because you don't have that preload essentially. Um, and then there's some other bits about how it can affect the heart, which I'll, I'll talk to you about in a second. But the main thing is just to be able to recognize that that's what's going on. Because if you've got a patient in atrial fibrillation, um, you sort of saying, oh, I think you're actually hypovolemic because, you know, um, you're in shock and actually your heart looks quite empty because it's going like the clappers um, and giving like multiple fluid boluses and not really getting anywhere is not going to be that helpful. Um, so you're kind of using your ECG to filter things out, using small volumes of fluids to assess the response um, is going gonna, is gonna to help you a lot. Um, so supraventricular tachycardia is not really that common. Um, but it's basically a rapid sinus rhythm. So it's usually coming from the sinus node and it's firing. Um, and it can be due to different things, um, heart disease, electrolyte drugs and toxins, often accessory pathways. So essentially, this is something that Labradors can, can get. Um, it's a bit more common in Labradors. Um, <coughs> but essentially what can happen is that the ventricle and the atria are kind of connected by an accessory pathway. So it'll go down through the middle, back round and just do a little shortcut loop and just keep firing and keep going round. Um, so it's a difficult one to diagnose. I think um, I struggle with them as well, to be honest, but you're gonna have a narrow um, sort of complex. It's not going to look like it's coming from the ventricle because actually it is originating from the sinus node. Um, you know, you might actually see the heart looks a bit underfilled because it's, tracting so quickly it's difficult to see but they're not really going to respond to your test of your fluid bolus and actually 
once your heart rate in a dog is over 220, you know it has to be an arrhythmia because it's outside of that normal physiological range. So that's honing you in to the fact that it's probably not going to be hypovolemia because even the most hypovolemic dog couldn't get its heart rate over 220. Um, so I think, again, like ruling a few things out and then if you get to the point where you think, oh gosh, could this be supraventricular tachycardia, then that's really when it needs to be referred. But just being aware of that as a kind of option. Um, and you can try a vagal manoeuvre. You won't have diltiazem, I wouldn't have thought, or esmolol. But if you feel like it's not likely to be any of the other things we've discussed, then a vagal manoeuvre could be something you can try and see if there's any response to that. So either pushing on the eye or on the, on the carotids and the jugular. Um, and then ventricular tachycardia, which I'm sure you see all the time. Um, so we can have, in dogs, it's usually a rate over 160, and in cats, it can be over 240. Um, and we can classify it as either sustained, so if it's going on for longer than 30 seconds or non-sustained, um, and paroxysmal if it's terminated really quickly and spontaneously. Um, so you might still have P waves, but they're not, because the, um, the atria of the SA node is still probably firing, um, but it's not kind of um, being converted into an organized ventricular contraction. So you'll have this wide and bizarre appearance to your QRSs. Um, and then sometimes you can also get, I don't know if I've got an R on T phenomenon on here, but essentially, I don't think I do. But if you have um, finishing a complex and then suddenly it, it sort of fires off immediately afterwards, um, people get a bit sort of like, oh gosh, like worried about that because it could predispose them to ventricular fibrillation. So usually we do want to treat a ventricular tachycardia. Um, and what kind of options do you have for that in practice? Yeah, lidocaine, so like two to four mg per kg lidocaine. Um, usually um, in dogs, we wouldn't really go above sort of six to eight mg per kg, and we can start to worry about lidocaine toxicity. I've only had to give lidocaine to a cat um, like twice, I think, and I think we, because they're much more sensitive to it, so we, I think we actually gave like 0.25 mg per kg and then went up and what 0.5 in total mg per kg, but you, you have to go really slowly with that and be very cautious. Um, just remember in case you know you do start to get neurological symptoms for any lidocaine related toxicity that um, intralipid is a really good treatment it'll sort it right out for you um, and I'll come back to something about cats so the clinical consequences of tachycardia so just to kind of whiz through this um, a couple of things so we've got decreased cardiac output so when we have atrial fibrillation your atria do actually contract and they contribute to filling your ventricles, more, you know, in addition to just gravitational flow. Um, so a loss of atrial contraction um, in a sort of organised way will reduce ventricular filling by 20% approximately. Um, and then also we've just got, if we've um, got a very, very high heart rate, we've got a reduced diastolic filling time. Um, the other thing is myocardial hypoxemia. So if your heart muscles are working over time, they're using so much oxygen, um, which means that they might end up becoming a bit hypoxic and, and shocky locally. Um, and then also decreased myocardial perfusion, which is one of my um, next slides. Um, and then the final thing is tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So um, essentially... They've done these horrible experiments, it's usually in America, where they put pacemakers in in dogs and they pace them at like 300 beats per minute for two weeks. And of course, their hearts are like jelly at the end of it, awful. Um, but just to be aware of it, in, particularly in Labradors, if you, if you get a dog come in that's got what looks like a DCM heart, so it's quite um, thin walled and it's like the systolic function doesn't look very good. Um, yeah, it could be DCM, but it could also be that they've had a heart rate of over 200 for a couple of weeks or so. Um, um, and actually they've got an accessory pathway um, and so actually if we you can do ablation for that so you can kind of go in and like ablate you know ablate that um, accessory pathway and then the heart can remodel and kind of get back to normal again so I wouldn't put a dog to sleep purely based on my view of the heart being like oh it's DCM like definitely get a cardiologist to check that for you because it could be this accessory pathway causing a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy and then also oh, well, cardiologists would tell that, yeah. Um, and I think they would do that probably through looking at an ECG to see, because you can get some certain changes on like a six lead ECG that will give you an indication that there might be an accessory pathway. Um, and then maybe some stuff from their scan, but I'm not sure. But I think it is something that, and they might also 
perhaps if it's like a non-classic breed, be a bit more cautious about checking all the different parts of the ECG lead and stuff. But yeah, they have a way to know. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then this is something I find super interesting. So why does diastolic time matter so much? And it's also important in... Um, in CPR so when you're doing CPR you know you do your compression down that's great but you always have to make sure you let the chest recoil in between so you get a good diastolic fill and the reason is that your um, coronary arteries are like behind your aorta so if you can see them there so when we have systole the aortic valves open up and they kind of block those coronary arteries and during diastole when those aortic valves close the blood in the aorta kind of whooshes back and it perfus perfuses the coronary arteries so diastolic time is really important because that is the time when the heart is perfused and systole is when the body is perfused so when we have a tachycardia, your heart will spend less time in diastole, so then you're going to have less myocardial perfusion, and it's working really hard as well, so it's causing damage. So you can imagine if that's chronic, that's really going to cause a lot of, a lot of issues for you. Um, so when we're thinking about treating tachyarrhythmias, so we need to treat any non-cardiac causes, so electrolyte derangement, anemia, hypoxemia as well, um, so try all of those things. Um, and again, consider our, our drug to choices. So, you know, maybe, I don't know if you guys have like norepinephrine and epinephrine and things, but, um, you know, avoid anything that could be sort of stimulatory of your beta ones. So, you know, even things like tabutaline potentially could as well. Um, and then the mainstay is going to be your antiarrhythmic drug, so lidocaine. Um, we sometimes use magnesium for like refractory ventricular arrhythmias, but lidocaine is usually, usually the one to use. Um, if you've got um, an AIVR, so accelerated, accelerated idioventricular rhythm, so it's less than 160, and it's not affecting blood pressure, then I'm not that fussed about treating it. I think people get quite worried about them. Um, it can just be because your heart's a bit unsettled and a bit unhappy, you know, if they've maybe had a splenectomy. Um, see if there's other things you can do to help them a bit as well. So it might be a bit of oxygen might help if they're a bit hypoxemic. It might be that they need a bit of blood. Maybe they need a bit of volume. So it's not always just lidocaine. It can be multifactorial things. Like they might be in pain. They might have a bit of a high sympathetic drive. Um, so just seeing if there's anything you can do to make them more comfortable, even taking them out for a pee, um, that can all help. Um, and then just a sort of warning with both cats and dogs, um, so when you get a wide complex tachycardia, so if you were to look at this, you would say, okay, those complexes look wide and bizarre. I think they're ventricular in origin rather than coming from the sinoatrial node where we'd expect tall and narrow complexes. But if you kind of imagine your PQRS T, when we have severe hyperkalemia, the first thing that goes is your P wave normally and you get atrial standstill. You can get tall tented T waves and then you get widening of your QRS. So this patient actually, and I've got loads of like good videos from other cases, um, actually was really hyperkalemic. Um, and essentially it's just got to the point where it looks like a VTAC. Um, so if you were to give um, lidocaine to a patient like this, you could potentially cause um, a cardiac arrest um, essentially because the lidocaine will work on inactivated sodium channels a bit more um, and when you've got this sort of hyperkalemia you've already got depolarization of your resting membrane potential so you've got more inactivated sodium channels because you're hyperkalemic and then you give lidocaine it inactivates and it has a better action on them long story short you want to try to avoid giving lidocaine to a patient that's markedly hyperkalemic because what you'll find is actually this is not a ventricular rhythm, it's a sinus rhythm, but it's, it's, um, it's wide and bizarre because of the hyperkalemia. So I think if you know you've got a dog that doesn't have an AKI and it doesn't have a urethral obstruction and it's got that appearance to it, probably, yeah, fine, give it some lidocaine, but try and pull some bloods really quickly and just check that there's not a hyperkalemia, particularly in your cats. Um, and what would you do actually if you had a rhythm like this and you checked and its potassium was eight or nine? What was the option for you? Someone said it? Mm, something that will work quicker? Someone said something like that? Calcium gluconate, yeah. So you want to give that and um, 
again, I won't go into detail, but that will just protect the heart from the effects of the hyperkalemia. Uh, Gives you about 20, 30 minutes to then try to bring down your potassium and either through giving them uh, glucose to get some endogenous insulin release or giving a little tiny dose of insulin followed up by a glucose CRI. Um, tibutaline actually can drive um, potassium into the cells and then you know relieving a urethral obstruction but you want to be released uh, going for calcium if you if you have that and it's hyperkalemia. Um, cool and then we've got just uh, uh, that's a lot of detail um reduce the systolic function so don't worry about calculating your fractional shortening it's not something that I would do um, in, in practice but have a little look so if you've got a patient in shock then do have a look to see how the heart's contracting um, and some of these patients can be like super dynamic so like you might have a parvo puppy who is you know volume loss everywhere and then the next day you're like gosh your heart um, it just isn't moving anymore and I would be obviously checking to see that they're not um, hypoglycemic but sometimes just being septic, being super ill, being really inflammatory, you know it can affect the heart as much as it can the other tissues in the body um, so you might actually then get some reduced systolic function so you know sometimes our really sick dogs they do end up getting a bit of hemobendin and if you've got a really bad hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome dog and you think you're up to date with your you know volume resuscitation you've not got any significant arrhythmias that are causing an issue for you um, you've got an appropriate heart rate um, but the blood pressure still pants then scan it and see what the the heart looks like it's doing um you know and you've got puma bend and you could give it orally down the ng tube or something like that and see does that help you it's got some positive inotropic support um you know it's not the end of the world to give that if if you were maybe a little bit incorrect i don't think one dose is going to be the be all and end all you can use dibutamine but um it can be a bit more arrhythmogenic so we tend to use pmo and um, we've got iv but i would also use po if needed um and then i think we've got another one which is our obstructive shock so just the last one so this is a, a big old pericardial effusion um, and that's one of the, and, and a GDV could also cause obstructive shock. So it's basically anything that will stop blood getting into your heart, so into the right atrium of your heart, because then, it then obviously can't feed around to your lungs and get back to your left atrium to give you your preload for your left ventricle. Um, one of the things you might pick up is the sort of um, electrical alternans on your ECG, so where you have a difference in the size of your complexes, and that's just really your heart swinging in the pericardium um, and giving you sort of different um, sort of focus of your, of your electrical activity down different axis, axes. Um, why does... Um, why does a pericardial effusion cause a reduced preload? So the right atrium, so these are all the pressures in your heart in different places. The right atrium has the lowest pressure of, of all of your vessels and all of your chambers. Um, so between two to eight millimetres mercury. Um, and essentially when the pressure in your pericardium gets very large, it compresses that right atrium. And it means that your blood can't flow and return to the right atrium. A really severe pericardial effusion will eventually do your left atrium and then the other other parts um, and so it causes uh, right atrial collapse and when you scan you can sometimes see that and etiologies for a pericardial effusion so there's lots of different things neoplasia unfortunately very common hemangiosarcomas and chemodectomas coagulopathy traumatic it could be just hemorrhage um, septic it's uncommon but it happens inflammatory fip and then also a left atrial rupture um, you know like a, a dog with a really bad um, thin left atrium because they've got really bad cardiac disease. I actually watched one rupture when I was scanning once. It was so cool. And it went and then it basically clotted at first because, you know, it would. And it was like this big sausage. And then um, and then over like the next hour, it kind of was all broken up um, and just went back to blood. And the dog was actually all right. Um, but that was a bit of a hairy one. Um, so the other thing I would say about this is we get a lot of requests um, for referrals for when people have diagnosed pericardial effusion can you just take it? And I think 
that they should be drained in practice before they are sent. By the time they get to you, they're with you because they're probably clinical enough and they're in shock. Um, so I, I think we've had, you know, not here, but they obviously I had quite a few in my residency that turned up dead on arrival. Um, it's really not a difficult thing to do. I know it seems really scary, but um, just call us and we'll talk you through it. We can like video chat you if you're not confident with it. Um, and you don't have to drain the whole thing. Sometimes just even poking a hole in it and it will drain into the thorax is enough to get your patient to be stable. Um, but And there's like YouTube videos and everything, but I think it is something that you're better off doing in, in practice than trying to refer them an hour and then they kind of are in obstructive shock and they die on arrival. Um, but yeah, we're happy to talk you through it. Um, and then the final one is the distributive shock. So. This is sort of kind of a typical appearance of it. So these horrible like congested mucous membranes. Um, rapid CRT. And essentially it's because your blood is pooling in your peripheral vasculature, your capillaries and your vessels. Um, and there can be lots of different causes, but sort of sepsis and SERS, um, neurogenic as well, anaphylaxis, um, hypoadrenal cortism, drugs and toxins. So really it's when all of your... All of your arteries have got a lot of tone, but your vessels, um, your, um, your veins should also have some tone to them as well. When you lose that tone, that's when we get this distributive shock and we get kind of sludgy, muddy blood that's not really moving along as it should be. Um, so we're not getting appropriate oxygenation to the tissues. And the reason that it can happen with hypoadrenal cortisone. Can anyone, I'll be really impressed if anyone can think about this, but remember we said about the beta one, beta two on the heart with the sympathetic innovation and then the M2 receptors, which is your acetylcholine. Um, well, we kind of also have that sort of set up with our vessels. Um, so why might hypoadrenal cortisone give you distributive shock? What kind of things do we lack with that potentially? Go on. Oh no. So steroids, cortisol, it basically sensitizes your body to your catecholamines. So it kind of helps like upregulate receptors for adrenaline and cortisol and um, adrenaline and norepinephrine. It makes sense if you're kind of needing to have a lot of stress hormone, you want to be able to respond to your fight and flight noradrenaline and epinephrine. So when we're lacking cortisol, um, we just don't respond to our endogenous catecholamines very well um, so our vasculature can be really sloppy and not like nice and tight as it should be um, and then I won't get into that that's a bit but then the other thing to kind of bear in mind is that um, why might distributive shock make you hypo well I suppose why might it affect your blood pressure I suppose it kind of does give you a relative state of hypovolemia but um, We've got this thing called our um, peripheral venous compartment or like our vascular capacitance. So in your veins, because they're a bit more elastic -y, um, they can kind of change in terms of how tight they are or, or, or loose. Um, you can store quite a bit of blood volume in there. Um, but as soon as we lose any of that kind of um, rigidity to our, to our veins, they suddenly hold an awful lot more blood. So it kind of... It's as if you've lost it, but it's actually just in your venous system. And so you don't have that good forward pressure. Um, so that's kind of what the vascular capacitance is. So what we need to do is suck them back in and get them all tight again. Um, and what kind of things can we, can we use to do that with? You all know of any drugs that might give you a bit of a... Epinephrine? Did you say norepinephrine or epinephrine? But both would do it. But yeah. Um, so yeah, you can give norepinephrine or epinephrine. Epinephrine has um, effects on the heart as well. So the one we tend to try to use a bit more is norepinephrine, which has kind of got a bit more sort of an alpha two agonist. Um, so treatment. If we've kind of got a loss of our blood volume into these like sloppy veins, um, we can pump up the blood volume a bit by giving a bolus. Um, we can give some hypertonic saline or we can give some crystalloids, but the issue is more with the veins needing to be a bit tighter. So actually then the thing to do would be to consider a vasopressor. Um, so norepinephrine titrated to effect would be the one that we'd be looking at mostly. Um, and then, yeah, if you don't think you would have that in practice, would you? Would you have norepinephrine? No. But you could definitely do, with the distributive shock ones, you could definitely do crystalloids and hypertonic. You can just give them more volume. Um, 
but you might be in a bit of a losing battle with that and that might be again a referral case because they might need some more catecholamine support. Um, if it's a patient that's been diagnosed with Addison's, then actually giving um, a steroid like either hydrocortisone or dexamethasone might help your, that resolve more quickly. But if it's a septic patient, they would probably need to be referred. Um, and then the final one is just anaphylaxis, just a little caveat. So how we would um, recognise it, so very acute onset. Cats tend to get dyspnea, they're more affected in their sort of airways. Dogs, gastrointestinal size, a bit of vomiting and, and, um, and diarrhoea. Tachycardia, refractory hypotension, hema abdomen can happen as well. Um, and that's really because you kind of get this histamine release from the guts into the kind of portal system. It causes um, basically diapodesis and sort of loss of blood from your, from your liver into your abdomen. Um, gallbladder wall edema, and then usually markedly elevated ALT, and the rest is kind of normal. Uh, and the reason I just mentioned that is that um, in anaphylaxis, we need lots of sort of different types of support. So we need increased heart rate and contractility and we need good blood pressure and we also need to have some bronchodilation. So if we look at epinephrine here, it acts on beta one, which is gonna give you more um, sort of cardiac contractility and, and also like increase your heart rate a bit. Beta two, which is gonna do some bronchial dilation um, and then alpha one, alpha two, so that's gonna give us some vasoconstriction. So the norepinephrine doesn't really do so much beta one, it doesn't really do any beta two. So the catecholamine of choice, if you have a patient with anaphylaxis would be epinephrine or adrenaline, just to kind of give you that difference. Um, and then only another slide to go, I think. Sorry, you've been very good. Um, so let's just say you've still got this patient that's got horrible blood pressure um, and you're not really sure what to do with it. So this is um, where you have to consider a few other bits and pieces. So um, your pH as well, which I don't know if many of you will have the option to um, sort of check your pH, but certainly metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis can cause vasodilation, it can affect your heart, your contractility, um, checking if your potassium needs to be titrated. So this might be really marginal gains. So like you've got a septic patient, they've got a bit of an acute kidney injury, their potassium's a bit high, can we get that to be normal? Um, sometimes if a patient, I've thrown everything at them, they're on lots of fluids, they've had their plasma, they've had some blood products, they've got some Pima Bendin on board, I still can't get a good blood pressure, they've got some norepinephrine on board, then if their calcium's a bit low, I might give them some calcium. Um, even if I wouldn't normally treat it from a hypocalcemia point of view, just because calcium contributes to giving you some vascular tone, um, just because of its role in like muscle contraction, um, so you might do that, making sure you've got an appropriate blood glucose, Cats as well, I just wanted to mention that a, an anemic cat is often hypotensive. I don't know why, um, but you know, maybe actually they do need um, a, a transfusion rather than just more fluids. Um, and then considering other things, you can, you can try and titrate, so like hypoxemia, um, and then any reversal of any sedative or anaesthetic agents as well. Um, and then finally, just to say no one dies without steroids, it is true. Um, I think so we can have this thing called critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency or CIRCI um, and this is more for your patients that have been very poorly for quite a while or they're septic or they're very sick um, or if they've got hypoadrenocorticism um, or potentially if they've got some anaphylaxis as well um, you might want to consider a steroid so the thing it does that's useful is it increases the number and the sensitivity of your adrenergic receptors. So in a very hypotensive patient, it will increase your alpha-2, alpha-1 receptors, the sensitivity of them to the catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and the number. And it also will inhibit the inducible form of nitric oxide. So sorry, I know this is a bit more complicated, but your endothelium will release nitric oxide if you're septic or you know, inflamed or there's any damage to the endothelium, which might even occur just if you've got you know, horrible inflammation from hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. Um, and actually sometimes steroids will will help to kind of inhibit that nitric oxide from being produced. And nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. So usually, it's not something I would be saying to you guys, like don't reach for steroids in your bog standard hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome case, but 
in a dog that's hypotensive, it's refractory to all kind of options, then sometimes we do put those really sick patients on a hydrocortisone CRI, a referral setting. Um, so I think, yeah, don't, don't um, be doing that probably without ruling out all these other bits and pieces, but just to be aware that it's an, it is an option. Um, yeah, and I think, and then the best dog that ever lived. Is there any questions? Mm. <laughs>